All right, welcome back. Um, hopefully you were able to create a, a pretty decent verification uh, requirements uh, matrix there. And uh, hopefully you've uploaded it. I'll, I'll get together with you. Maybe we can have a little discussion board. I'll send an announcement uh, about how to um, work this. Okay. Now what I want to get into is uh, actual the verification aspect. Uh, I want to finish up our verification discussion by actually talking about uh, how 15288 looks at it. They actually uh, feel that the purpose of verification is to provide that objective evidence that the system or system elements fulfill their speci specified requirements or characteristics. And as you can see, we have um, our inputs coming in, mainly your integration system and integration report. Your activities is prepare for verification, perform it, and manage the results. Your output is basically your verified system down here as well as your reports and records. And notice your RVTM uh, finishes up at this point. Here are the uh, inputs uh, in the way they're described in the SC, the Encozy SE handbook. Uh, as you can see here, we're actually getting um, the integrated system and system element coming out. We talked about preparing for your verification where you think through the strategy, what kind of verification requirements, what kind of verification enabling aspects uh, systems or products or services you need to um, buy. Uh, you need to make sure they're available. And then, of course, you actually perform the verification where you implement the plan that you uh, created during your preparation uh, phase of this process. You need to manage the results of all the um, data that's collected during this time frame, this process. Uh, including your requirements verification traceability matrix. You need to uh, maintain that as well as any uh, other traceability or any verification activities. And of course, the results is the main thing that you're concerned with. Here, uh, as you can th see, we have some strategy enabling requirements and constraints and procedures that kind of occur when you're doing that plant preparing for the verification. Once you actually perform the verification, your final RVTM is now available and your verification system reports and records. Okay, what I want to do now is play a NPR segment uh, that actually is going to uh, talk about the creation of the electronic calculator almost 40 years ago. Uh, I think you'll find this uh, fairly interesting. And what I'm going to do is ask you what kind of T&E strategy was employed. Uh, I want you to think about that as we're playing it. Okay, so here you go. Four decades ago, technology had different challenges. Engineer Jerry Merriman had been at Texas Instruments for two years when his boss gave him this assignment. He said, We'd like to have some sort of personal computing device, maybe something to compete with a slide rule that you could hold in your hand. It would have to have some buttons to input the problem, uh, maybe some neon lights or something to output the answer, and of course it would work on batteries. You'd have to think of something, and boy, we sure did have to think of something because none of those things were ready to go in 1965. A year and a half later, Merriman and his team produced the world's first handheld electronic calculator. That was 40 years ago this past week. Jerry Merriman went into a studio in Dallas to tell us about it. It was about four by six inches by about an inch and a quarter, and uh, certainly that would make a lump in your pocket, <laughs> but its predecessor in 1965 was a transistorized calculator that weighed 55 pounds, set on a desk, uh, <laughs> used enough power to plug in the wall, and it cost $2,500, so wow. it was a pretty big change. One, one thing that strikes me when i looking at your calculator here is that it doesn't have a screen, that it's got tape that comes out the side. If you look closely, there's a, a transparent window, and you read the numbers on the tape. That's your immediate answer. Eventually, the paper comes out the side, and you can save it if you like. <laughs> and I gather it's because the screen wasn't invented yet. There was no screen. Well, light-emitting diodes, the little brilliant red things, mm -hmm. uh, 
We were trying to make those in 1965, but they only put out infrared light. You couldn't see it, and we hmm. thought that was a disadvantage. Yes, <laughs> I could see how that would be a disadvantage. <laughs> what could your calculator do? It's, it's what was later called a four function. It could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. It had a decimal point. It took in uh, inputs up to six digits and made up to 12-digit answers. It printed about 12 characters per second. So the maximum time to get an answer was about a second. Huh. What were some of the challenges that you encountered when you were designing this? Well, there weren't any examples of thin, cheap, reliable keyboards that would work a million times. Another problem was all those transistors were going to use way too much power and you didn't want a car battery to carry around. You wanted a little <laughs> battery. And we we did some work on that. I remember making the battery charger myself in my, my garage. It was a sort of a little black fist-like thing that plugged in the wall and had a little wire that went to the calculator. And one of the most daunting things was testing the parts that we built. Uh, integrated circuits in 1965 had maybe 20 transistors, and they had 14 or 16 wires coming off of them. Testing was fairly straightforward. We built larger chips that had thousands of transistors on them and had up to 120 wires coming off of them. Some of them are inputs asking questions, and the others are outputs giving the results. The number of combinations of that is just astronomical, and it was a daunting task to verify that any given piece of the calculator was doing its job. Uh, in order to solve that problem, we made a breadboard of the calculator that is a model of it using regular integrated circuits. It, it occupied a, a two-tiered six-foot table with lots of visible <laughs> wiring, and we used it to mimic the calculation, and then some sub-portion of the calculator was uh, checked against the candidate chip, and that was sort of a breakthrough in testing as well. When I was growing up, everybody had the uh, calculators on their wrist watch. And one of the controversies then and before was that students could bring them to class and cheat by having a calculator in their class. Well, you know, I don't see that as cheating. I see that as extending your reach and grasp. Maybe if students today are not so proficient with a pencil adding numbers on the back of an envelope, they've traded that for the ability to handle problems that were not in their purview before in the same way that you might say that an automobile inhibits walking, but look how far you can go. Jerry Merriman joined us from Dallas. He is the man who invented, with his team at Texas Instruments, the first electronic handheld calculator. Thank you very much. Thank you. For okay, so hopefully that made sense, as uh, and also hopefully you thought about what kind of strategy they came up with. Uh, one of them was to actually do this verification of the actual integrated circuit before it was created using this test bed. And as you can see, it's a lot of wires and it was a, a breadboard of what eventually would become a small integrated circuit that would actually fit within the uh, calculator that they were creating. But that was one of his daunting um, points is how do you actually test something that's never been tested before. And of course, uh, this actually is a model of the integrated circuit that they were going to happen, uh, have. So they could actually model the ver and, uh, use modeling during the verification to s simulate any external interface. They may have environments that they were looking at as well as, and, and of course you could update your models with that real data that you get out of your verification uh, that you're doing. Of course, you need to consider the cost of verification and that's where simulations, uh, the physical and integration aspect of things uh, have to be taken into account. The other things you may wanna think through is automation in order to make your, uh, if you have a lot of testing that's happening and they are something that you can actually um, perform repetitively instead of having someone else do it you can automate it and have it done rather quickly uh, please don't forget as you're coming up with your procedures and your tests or, or analysis type um, aspects or documents think about your past fail criteria that needs to be very clear um, especially explaining not only what your past fail criteria is like 
uh, make sure there's a plus or minus whatever uh, so that you have a range. Uh, you may want to think about overflow conditions, testing for that. How bad when something goes beyond uh, what the specs have, how bad does it break? Uh, does it actually destroy the system or, or can it still be used afterwards? And of course, uh, making sure you're getting ready for the validation process, running through whatever concept of operation that's out there and uh, preparing for that because that's where your validation will come into play. We'll cover that more uh, next week. Um, when it comes to verification as well as validation, there are actually different um, type tests, uh, and verification and validation could probably fit into these categories. Like, for instance, your uh, development test would probably be verification, where you're trying to demonstrate the indeed um, you know, you, you have an item and it can actually work the way you designed it for. A qualification test where you prove that the article has gone through the manufacturing process and it comes out on the other end uh, and it actually works the way that you intended to. Acceptance test is where you're transitioning your system to a customer. You run a test for the customer to feel comfortable with it and then you can go. Now, a lot of times that's validation, right? And then operational test is where you actually s submit your system to an operational environment and run it operationally. And that also can be part of an acceptance test and it's part of your validation. Now, what I wanna do is just uh, do the, um, a few slides here just to talk about the DOD perspective when it comes to T&E. Of course, that's test and evaluation, um, and it has to be kind of structured throughout the um, uh, acquisition process for D DOD. And what they really know that, and they don't call it V&B, &V, and they probably should, but they call it test and evaluation. There's a reason for that, and I'll show you uh, the reason when we get into the definitions. But what they're looking for is essential information to help uh, decision makers make decisions, of course. Also, uh, make sure that your technical performance is in accordance to whatever parameters are in place. And determine whether the sy system is indeed uh, operationally effective, suitable, survivable, and safe uh, in its intended use. So the whole idea of having it operational is uh, the key thing for the TNE program. So the t &E program does indeed take into account uh, development uh, as well as uh, operational type tests. Uh, you conduct t &E, uh, integrating modeling and simulation, trying to make t &E part of that feedback learning mechanism that's part of your development strategy. Also, you're trying to figure out if the technology that you're going to incorporate is mature enough that the inter interoperability aspects of it are in place and that you have uh, facilitated the integration uh, into whatever forces uh, that have been fielded prior uh, to your new system. And of course, make sure that you are meeting the capability that was the reason for creating the system in the first place. So what is T&E, test and evaluation? Well. That's a process where the system and components provide information when it comes to risk and risk management, and it permits the assessment of the attainment of the various uh, performance specs and system maturity in order to figure out if your system can survive within the operational environment. So there are two types of t and &E, dt and &E, that's developmental, test and evaluation, and ot &E, which is operational test and evaluation. You can almost look at dt and &E as your verification, ot and &E as validation. t and &E identifies the levels of performance and assess, assists the developer, uh, developer correcting any deficiencies found during these test events. There is a difference between test and evaluation Test denotes the actual thing that you do um, in terms of uh, program or procedure. 
uh, in order to actually uh, figure out, you know, it's the thing that you do in order to obtain the data. Once you have that data, you need to actually evaluate it to see if indeed you may have to analyze or whatever, but you're analyzing that uh, data, evaluating it in order to make sure that you meet the expected performance or other aspects um, of the system that you're concerned with. So testing is getting the data, evaluation is analyzing that data. So if you recall, um, I don't know if I showed you this before, um, but the acquisition uh, work, uh, the acquisition processes uh, for the DOD community is fairly large. And it's really here at Milestone B where you actually do your uh, T and E assessments in order to figure out if you should go ahead and move ahead on the actual um, developing your things. And that's when you start working your test and evaluation master plan or management plan temp. And um, milestone C is where you actually, those assessments let you know, oh, did we actually meet the um, aspects we were thinking about? And that, of course, includes the aspect of actually getting it into production and fielding it. So t and &E is that uh, significant element in the decision-making process that provides data that re support trade-off analysis, risk reduction, and requirements refinement. So let's look at this as we go through uh, the test and evaluation. You usually do an evaluation up front, and then you start thinking about your development testing and evaluation. From an operation standpoint, they will do early operation uh, assessments, and then they'll do some operational assessments, even during DT&E. And then you would actually do your OT&E um, after the developmental T&E is finished. And then once you take your system and actually deploy it and put it into its where the site is, you would have some test and evaluation at the site. Now there may be other uh, certifications you need like modeling simulation or interoperability or information assurance. That's actually a fairly big one for DOD. Most, um, have, most systems have that as a key performance parameter because you want to be able to uh, ensure your information is secure, and also that it interoperates with other systems that have been fielded. And then after you're, you've actually deployed it, you may have some test and evaluations where you would actually uh, verify that it was deployed correctly. So once you do that, you say, hey, maybe it's not working the way or getting um, care, taking care of that uh, capability we need or it may not be enough capability so you would actually may come up as you can see you kind of filter all the way back around and you can come up with a new concept and that would identify a new need and you would go through this process again of developing a system here's how through the um, the um, DOD acquisition process you at milestone A, you should have a test strategy in, involved uh, right from the very beginning, even as you're coming up with your concept. Uh, then you would actually come up with a preliminary test and evaluation uh, management plan. And from there, the temp would actually be updated as you go through your development. And then you would update it again as you go through full uh, production rate. Notice here in blue, your developer kind of owns all the testing, your operation uh, will come into play after it's been built and ready to be deployed. All right, let's uh, look at that one section where you come up with your test and evaluation strategy describing what uh, you expect to do uh, during your uh, engineering manufacturing development phase of your um, project that you're involved in. Notice you have some verification plans uh, that you need to evolve your technology and development phases. And notice you have links that move over to when you actually do verification. 
and that's where you actually do the appropriate demos if it is that type of verification. And of course you have a validation demo at the very end. So your strategy supports the, um, how you would actually use these for milestone decision and it's eventually your strategy is replaced by your temp for all increments after that. So let's move this over and actually look at the fact you now have your test and evaluation master plan, uh, management plan, where you actually generate all your test and evaluation plans. And then you would have a system verification plan. This kind of explains how your subsystems, how you would actually verify and validate those, as well as think about verification validation on the system as a whole. Then you go ahead and build the system, code it, you integrate it and verify those various elements of the configuration item and you verify the performance compliance to specs prior to you doing any live fire or integration of your uh, DT&E. Notice your linkages come into place both at the verification and validation level. So remember D, D, and E is chiefly concerned um, making sure your engineering design goals have been met. And you do have a test readiness review where you actually review the contractor's readiness to begin testing on both hardware and software configuration items. Notice here you have your verification validation link coming over. And there are times you may actually combine your DTE with OTE or your live fire because the developer actually wouldn't have the ability to run live fire because you're running it against uh, perhaps other missiles and things like that. The government has to help you out with that. But OTE &E focuses on questions of operational effectiveness, suitability, and survivability, not so much worried about this system um, at the lower level, it's more at the high level. And once you do this, you should have some test reports which actually disseminate the results to various officials or office staff or the acquisition community altogether. And of course, you now have a permanent record where you stand with those things. Now let's look a little bit um, further into what's called a document tree where you have your test and evaluation master plan, uh, management plan right here. And that's of course helping you with your uh, design. You have your integrated test plan, your detailed test plan. All that comes to the point where you actually run the plan, get the results and put them into a test report. So the test and evaluation master plan or management plan is fairly important. It's actually a contract between your Operational com uh, command, that's your customer. Uh, when I was working for the Navy, it was OpNav. Um, or in your material command, I work for NavC, Navy C Systems Command. They're the ones that are actually acquiring the product. And your operational test for, uh, authority for me, the Navy, as I was working for them, that was OpTet4, Operational Test and Evaluation Force. All of them have to work together in order to create your test and evaluation master plan. Uh, lessons learned from t and &E, it's useful and helpful for reducing technical risk, should be an integrated part of whatever system engineering process that you are part of. And of course, it's that validated step feedback loop to make sure your system design is correct. And of course, a strong t test and evaluation manager would really make um, sense as you go forward on this. All right, so that didn't that wasn't too bad. I'm, I'm glad we were able to get through that quickly. Um, if you have any questions, let's go ahead and put them up on the um, uh, discussion board. I'll make a thread that talks to uh, lecture 10 here. And that way, uh, ask your question there and uh, let me know. I'll answer it and then everybody can see the question and answer. 
Uh, you do have some homework. It's on Blackboard. Basically, what I want you to do is take a requirement that you got from that adaptive control, control cruise control you did for homework three, and actually write a verification requirement for it. It's, it's all on Blackboard. If you have any questions, uh, again, put it into the discussion board. Uh, don't forget your TRR. That's going to be due in a few weeks. You definitely want to do that. And uh, lecture 11 will be next week, your read ahead and quizzes as we go along. As you can see, we're making good progress here. Uh, only a few more quizzes, one more homework, and your TRR and, we sh and your final, and then we'll have everything we need to grade you. All right, um, I'm glad we were able to get together like this from a, um, uh, from a video standpoint. Um, We'll get together next week. We'll see you then. Okay, bye-bye.